parents were from Overton County, their parents were, their parents were, their parents were. The farm I live on right above that is the Oakley Cemetery, and my great-great-grandfather was buried there in 1840. Except right. for going away to school and military service, have you lived anywhere but Roan County? Nowhere else. Have you ever wanted to live anywhere but Roan County? Nowhere else. <laughs> Throughout the United States in the 1800s, there were areas of the country in which certain families had feuds. And in Appalachia, one of the more famous and notorious feuds was between the Hatfields and the McCoys. On my father's side, he's one of the real McCoys from East Kentucky. He was one of 13 children, nine who survived. My father was a pilot in the Air Force. Okay. We moved every two to three years, depending on his assignment. In this long list of different places that you lived growing up, was there a place that felt the most like home? But when I think about sort of the house and the impact of growing up, the three years we spent in The Hague was, was pretty important. I think the whole family really had a, uh, a fairly, uh, what I would call ecumenical view of the world and, and not so rooted in local ideas or local ways of life. Did you want to be a lawyer in high school? Uh, I wanted to be what my daddy wanted me to be, and probably he hadn't really decided at that point. My father told me to be a lawyer because that way you'd never have to work for anyone. And obviously, my father was never a lawyer. I think lawyers work for everybody. <laughs> when I told my father that I was thinking about going to law school, he was not very supportive. There's several great things that he said, such as, why do you want to go to law school? Going to law school is like being a prostitute. All you do is sell your services. <laughs> I have to say, there wasn't a lot of encouragement, but I had that half tuition scholarship. And so I came. How many lawyers <laughs> did you know uh, when, when you decided to go to law school? One. My uncle James Dudley called the house in Meigs County, Tennessee, was the only lawyer I knew. I'd never been in a courtroom. I'd never seen him in a courtroom. I didn't know anything about law school. Growing up, I didn't know what a lawyer was until I watched television, and it was a show called The Defenders. Being a lawyer sounded pretty good. I only applied for one law school, and that was uh, Ole Miss, and it was a terrible reason. Uh, and that was because Archie Manning was coming back for his senior year. In the fall of 73, uh, my memory is there were three women in the third year class, 16 in the second year class, and 33 in my class. And there was one one whole bathroom uh, in Vanderbilt Law School for women. And it was very inconveniently located. You hardly could get there between classes, uh, let alone be able to use it because there were too many of us. So we approached the administration and said we needed more restrooms for women. And they said, well, you guys can use the women's staff restroom. Well, that was uh, equally uh, uh, inconveniently located in another direction. And it only had two stalls. Uh, and so uh, we finally just got sick of it and we liberated uh, the most centrally located large restroom at the law school. It was a men's restroom. We just planted a sign on the door that said women. Uh, and the men didn't give it up easily for the, about the first week. You might come out of a stall and find a man using the urinal. Uh, but they did eventually give it up and the administration gave us that restroom. We formed the Women Law Students Association that year, and uh, uh, we had the courage to do that, which we needed to do. <laughs> Bill Dearman and Bob Warner, who were practicing law here in Nashville, invited me to be a part of their firm, and they generously called it Dearburn, Warner, and Alexander. So I began practicing law in Nashville 
in 1971. Our clients were uh, varied. Uh, our most, our steadiest client was Commerce Union Bank, so I did a lot of bank work. But I began to get introduced to other cases. I did a labor case in, with Don Stansberry in Scott County. That was the time of the wage and price controls, and it created a huge bureaucracy in Washington, but you could get exemptions from it. Suddenly there was a line of people, clients, outside my door a mile long, not because I was a great lawyer, but they thought I knew somebody in yeah. Washington <laughs> helped them get an exemption. That didn't last very long. I really didn't make that many appearances at all mm -hmm. because there was still this feeling that clients really wouldn't like a woman representing them in court. Did that? Did that? No, I was allowed to go. I was allowed to do appeals. Really? I did a couple of appeals to the Court of Appeals. I actually did one to the Supreme Court. Ole Miss was diploma privilege. Um, I've never taken a bar exam. So you automatically got a Mississippi law license yeah. in, for graduating right. from Ole Miss Law School. And then later came back to Ole Miss and by reciprocity was uh, brought in. Never taken any bar exam anywhere. Never have. That has I, to be I, fairly unique, I think, I, doesn't it? It probably is, uh, but I, I'm not uh, unhappy about that. <laughs> My life's work was trying to get parents to support their children. We have good support laws, we just need to enforce them, so I hope they keep up my legacy of enforcing these child support orders and seeing that the children are educated and provided for. You started Rural Legal Services of Tennessee with the federal grant. That was 1978. A woman named Onalia Neal came into the office wanting a bankruptcy, instead of just handing her the form saying, fill it out, come back when it's done, said, why do you want a bankruptcy? And she basically described a situation of home improvement in which she was cheated by a private contractor who didn't do the work he was supposed to do and the work was supposed to be paid by the Farmers Home Administration, which runs a low-income housing development improvement project. We determined that Farmers Home had negligently inspected the work. Now, only Anil, elder woman living by herself, a cafeteria worker, in the local elementary school, doesn't have the resources. So she came for the bankruptcy. We'd lost in the district court, won in the Sixth Circuit, and then the farmer's home appealed. About three years later, Lenny was arguing that case before the US Supreme Court. We had a moot court in front of nine UT law professors. They all solemnly declared that it was a loser. Thurgood Marshall wrote the opinion, and we won nine to nothing. What is it that you enjoy most about practicing law? Well, you're helping people, you're doing something for them, and you make a pretty good living with it. What was it about jury trials that intrigued you? I'm I'm a big fan of juries, um, and it's from my days of being a, a clerk and watching the juries in action when I was a clerk. And I just am a great believer in the jury system. I think they generally get it right. What is it that makes you believe that they generally get it right? I think they, I think they take their jobs very seriously. I think they listen carefully. I think they pick up on things that other people don't, or maybe other people don't think they'll pick up on. And I think they sometimes don't necessarily get there for the, for the right reason, but they get to the right result. Mm -hmm. What's your secret to picking a good jury? I think you try to read your juror when you're talking with him, him or her. And uh, you get an idea right then if they're listening to you. You get an idea whether they respect you.
It may be a wrong idea. You may take one on and he's hurt you some, some to surprise you. It's just a matter of eye contact and their response to the questions you would ask. You can gather from that if they are actually thinking like you do. You can't excuse everyone who doesn't. We represented a lot of insurance companies in uh, car, car accidents and things like that all over West Tennessee. We did represent. a lot of cases go to trial then? They, di they did. I love to try cases. And uh, I, I tried them in every county. And uh, I thought I was pretty good. Now, I did not wear bow ties then. <laughs> yeah, there was not, not anything better than going into a small town, a little snotty nose lawyer from Jackson with a bow tie on. You know, you're just asking for trouble. And uh, so I had a brown suit I wore to trial. The My Lai Massacre in Vietnam, which was where American soldiers on March 16, 1968, slaughtered up to 500 Vietnamese civilians. There were rapes, gang rapes. Two line companies were involved, even though when the publicity came out, it was only about one, and only, really only about one officer, a second lieutenant by the name of William L. Calley, Jr. The orders are given that they're to kill everything and everyone in the village. So when I come through the village, I don't want to see anything walking, living, breathing, crawling, moving, or growing. And Cali participated in it. He participated in a big way. He ordered people to kill people. And the thing about it is, all we ever heard about was Cali, and all we ever heard about was what he did. But more than 500 people died that day with the commanding officers. Medina's on the ground. Lieutenant Colonel Barker's in a helicopter here. Colonel Orrin Henderson's in a helicopter here. And Major General Samuel Costum's in a helicopter here watching and communicating with what's on the ground. In September of 1971, I'm appointed to defend Lieutenant William L. Calley, Jr. and his appeals. Because he'd already been convicted. He was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Mass murder. Here's a five foot three inch, 109 pound second lieutenant, the lowest ranking officer on the ground, and he's the only one convicted. I Defended Cali at the Court of Military Review. I knew we were going to lose. We lost three zip. Took it to the Court of Military Appeals. Thought we had a shot there. We lost two to one there with Chief Judge Darden dissenting, saying that he was tried under the wrong standard, which I had argued we're scurrying around. Cali's going to be transferred to Leavenworth, and he's going to be in a different federal jurisdiction. I send the habeas corpus petition to Latimer. He sends it to Henson, who files it and gets an immediate stay of of his transfer to Leavenworth, and then there's machinations. It ends up that Judge Elliott reverses his conviction, orders him freed, the Army appeals it. The Army's lawyer who had been the clerk for Chief Judge Brown on the Fifth Circuit gets on the phone, gets a stay order issued ex parte. Uh, that irritates me a little bit. By this time, I'm out of the Army, so I file a motion in the Supreme Court of the United States asking the supervisory justice to take note of the fact that this ex parte proceeding has taken place and that's unfair and we'd like to be heard. Apparently, it was Justice Lewis Powell who contacted the judges in the Fifth Circuit and told them to get get on the stick down there and all of a sudden all of the judges of the Fifth Circuit are meeting in New Orleans. They have lifted the stay. Cali uh, can remain out of jail while the appeal is going on and the judges decide to hear the case en banc. So we argue the case there. We lose it eight to five with Griffin Bale writing a scathing dissent. I've gone and seen the Secretary of the Army and asked him to commute Cali's sentence. He commutes it from 20 to 10 years, and then he orders him released on parole. 
So he's out of jail. So Callie spent a total of uh, about three and a half weeks in Leavenworth and the rest of it in confinement to his quarters and he is free, but his conviction is upheld. The Supreme Court denied certiorari in uh, April of 75, 76. But that's the Callie story. But he came to Covington, Tennessee. I got to know him very well. I've still got it on my phone messages, left the message, I love you. I think the experience of representing someone like that against all the odds and fighting the powers that be, it just changed my life. When I clerked for the federal judge, for, for Judge Sork, was when I realized what I really wanted to do was be a judge. And I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a judge. <laughs> and so I had to figure out how to get there. In uh, August, the election tail? Yes. And who won the election? I did. There you go. <laughs> yes, I remember that well. Never. I mean, it was doubt. what I was born to do. Real. I felt like I, I just died and gone to heaven. I mean. <laughs> It was, it was that much of a relief. And what was it about it that really just, you just said, oh, this is so good? It just felt natural. Yeah. Uh, I probably prepare for my trials as much as I did as a lawyer. I always have a chronology. I've read everything. And so I have consistently gotten as much kick out of being the judge as being a lawyer, which was a big shock to me. When I went to federal court, the, the thing that I hated the most was when he said, because I had never had a she, I'm going to take this matter under advisement. And I thought, you just heard the case. We've given you everything there is. Why can't you decide it? You know, you've got all the facts. You've got the law. So I had said to myself, <clears throat> if I can render a decision when the people are still there, that is my goal. There are some cases where you can't do that, where you, tax cases lend themselves to being taken under advisement. But you really should give these people, if you have prepared and you've studied everything and you've read those briefs and you know what the case law is, you should be able to give them a decision. And what I tended to do was to say, I've heard everything you have to say. I'm going to decide this right now. I'm going to review my notes. I'm going to review all the exhibits. If you want to sit in the courtroom, that's fine. If you want to go outside and wait. And I would sit on the bench and they could look through the window and they would see me making a decision. And that's what I would do. I'd make my notes about what I was going to say. Might be an hour, might be an hour and a half, might be two hours. Call them back in and say, this is the decision. Why did you stay in the courtroom and do that rather than go to your chambers? I think that I did it more as a personal um, preference. I do think judges get off and go back in their office and people think, what is taking the judge so long? You sit on the bench and they see that you are there with your paper and your pen and you're not talking to your clerk and you're not getting a cup of coffee, but you are seriously considering their case. That means something to them. Did you ever want to be a judge? No. Why not? I'd just rather have a, I, I don't want to be up there neutral. I want to have an opinion on a case, whether it's good or bad, I want to have one. I would rather just be an advocate. I'd been appointed to represent <coughs> three young men Live in Dry Hollow. All of everybody in that area, that Dry Hollow was either Loopers or Nards. These boys were charged with burning his haystacks. We were trying the lawsuit, and Mr. Loopers on the stand, and I remember as well as it were yesterday. Developed it was at night, the, the alleged burning. It was rainy then. It was. He said, "Oh yes, it was raining. That was a dark night." Yes, Mr. Looper. And I went on and on and on about that. And he, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I finally made the fatal mistake. I said, Mr. Luber, just how far can you see after dark? 
he scratched his head and he said, he said, Mother Vaughn, I can see the moon. How far is that? <laughs> and uh, uh, they, they were, boys were convicted. They weren't, they weren't in position to testify. But uh, I was reminded about what Judge Gillery used to say, if you prove your point, quit. Oh, I just loved democratic politics. I can remember just as a kid, it must have been 32, I would have been six years old when Roosevelt ran against uh, Hoover. And I can remember people saying bad things about Herbert Hoover. Did you ever think about being a Republican? No, no. <laughs> My mother felt that Franklin Roosevelt kept us all from starving. And what he did with TVA would have probably accomplished that. Winfield Dunn was a spectacular candidate. John J. Hookers was the Democratic nominee, and Bill Willis, the lawyer from Nashville and law partner, was his manager. And Willis and I would meet every Monday to talk about the debates that we might have, and we became good friends, and we arranged the debates. And of course, neither of us were modest, so both of us thought we would make better governors than either John J. or Winfield, <laughs> but we were the only ones who thought that. And it was fun because some of the best people in the state were involved in it and trying to make the state better on the other side as well. I was meeting with somebody who was giving me some political advice and, and they said, now when you go to these places and you meet these people, don't drive your Cadillac and don't wear your fur coat. <laughs> and I said, but that's not me. And I said, besides, my fur coat and my Cadillac are paid for by my own self. I worked hard to get that. And so he said, I give up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> drive what you want. When Big Al went, went to the Senate, we got Joe Evans uh, as our congressman in those counties up there. And Judge Officer told him that I'd be a good guy to help him. I remember putting those uh, fans out of all the churches then. Didn't there was no air conditioning. Those wooden fans like that. Yes, sir. And somebody showed me one not long ago, and we put filled the churches full of them, courthouses and everywhere. And it was at Joe's picture on one side and Jesus on the other. And they you'd fan and you'd say, Jesus, Joe, Jesus, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I went to work for Howard Baker and Bob Worthington, who never asked me to do anything except the absolute right thing to do. And so by the time you've done that a while, you've got a little background. So I would encourage people to try to associate with people of high integrity. I'd, I'd encourage them to find something they like to do. I just don't think you're very good at anything if you're not happy with what you're doing. It was still the old practice. You know, you'd go eat lunch together in Jackson. They would, uh, at two o'clock, all the coffee drinkers would go down to the cafe there on the square and drink coffee. The, the bankers would come out and they would, uh, they would talk. And now I see young lawyers, they run into Subway to get something to take out and take back to the office. And that camaraderie among people is, is lacking. We have sold everything to the powerful. We've sold it to corporations. They control the legislators with uh, the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court's decision in uh, Citizens United. Uh, we have somehow said that corporations have a right to speech. Uh, I assume they have a right to bear arms too, since they are, uh, so we can have private armies. I, it's just incredible to me that a country that was founded on the idea that of individual liberty, we have bought and sold it. Well, I just finished um, Otis Sanford's book, From Boss Crump to King Willie. Otis Sanford, who was formerly the editor of the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Yes. Now a journalism professor. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I go fishing, I try to read things I don't usually read. I like Emily Dickinson's poems, and I read those. I especially like the one where she says, uh, 
I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. <laughs> <laughs> David Brooks, The Second Mountain, Songs of America, which is Meacham and uh, Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw's I finished Soul of America by Meacham. Uh, going back and reading Francis Schaeffer, Reason for God by Tim Keller. I think I've got seven books I'm reading right now. I tend to read novels, Ann Beatty, Ann Tyler, uh, you know, trash detective stories by William Connolly and people like that. I don't read anything at all anymore. I listen to books. If you decide to live in Huntsville, you have decided to spend a lot of time driving your car. And I love to listen to murder mysteries, legal thrillers. Uh, John Grissom's are particular favorites. But I just listen to books. Up and down I-40, do you read or listen to books? I am listening to Churchill, 42 discs of Churchill. And I will say, I never wanted it to end. How old are you now? 87. And what are you doing every day now? Uh, get up every morning, go to work wherever I am. I, I sleep to 5.30. How long now have you been on the bench? 20 years on this bench. Are you planning to be on the bench for another 20 years? I'll probably be on the bench until I just heal over dead. At this point, I hadn't made too many people mad, and I could retire respectfully. And, you know, I've missed the people, but I have not missed the work. And my goodness, you can go to a movie during the day when you couldn't do that when you were working, and you can have lunch with your friends, and I can actually, you know, do things I thought I couldn't do. Like I made zucchini bread the other day. It's just a whole new world to discover when you're retired.